just in case you're wondering what this picture is about, uh, I'm the guy on the right, by the way. I'm, I'm, uh, it's one of my favorite shots because the man um, didn't know his age. And uh, so I asked him how old he was, and he had no idea. Uh, he knew he was born at the time of the kingdom. Uh, I'm talking about the, late, the last Egyptian kingdom, King Farouk, probably King Fouad before. And it was impossible to tell his age. He might have been anything, 18, 90. I don't know, how does it look for you? Maybe 100? Uh, I like this picture because it, he probably is uh, genetically the descendant of a lost uh, race, <clears throat> or rather a lost people. I tend not to use the word race these days because, um, as you may or may not know, but the latest uh, <clears throat> anthropological and genetic research has confirmed us to be all from one source. And uh, let me just snap the other picture. Uh, uh, Paul Devereux showed the, the, the planet. I'm showing it again. Uh, somewhere there, somewhere in East Africa, sometime around 200,000 years ago, a black African woman gave birth. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. But whether a boy or a girl, she gave birth to the first modern man. Something happened that converted one type of primitive human being into modern man. And we all start there. Uh, they've given her a lovely name. You might have seen this on the BBC documentary they had uh, last year. They called her the African Eve. And every human being on this planet comes from this source. Each one of us. Whether we're Chinese, uh, Turkish, Americans, whatever. We come from this source. Uh, we come from a black African source. And uh, <clears throat> I tend to say, uh, some may find it shocking, I don't know, but uh, we are all of the same race. It's a fact, it's no more a hypothesis. We are all from the same race. My story tonight is the Egyptian civilization. Uh, there's always been a big question. Where did it come from? And for a long time, uh, Egyptologists have assumed uh, that it was homegrown, it just sprung rather fast. Uh, there's been many, many arguments as to how quickly it started. And the conventional view of Egyptian history is that somewhere around 3000 BC or so, uh, the first dynastic uh, king united Egypt into, uh, into one kingdom. They called it the two kingdoms of one kingdom. And that's where history starts, uh, Egyptian history starts. Uh, I've been very, very focused uh, over the last 25 years on one period, uh, which is the Old Kingdom. Some of you have read my books, perhaps, mainly to do with the pyramids. And there's a strange psychological barrier uh, between history and prehistory. We, we've kind of drawn a line. Uh, we talk about the historical period and the prehistorical period. And for some reason, the prehistorical period is not so interesting, uh, certainly to Egyptologists. Uh, but it's just names we give to, to things. There is no such thing as history or prehistory. There's one continuous event. I was, I was going to talk about cosmology a bit. Uh, and you might well ask what it has to do with ancient Egypt, but there's something that uh, I find very, very useful uh, these days when I talk about ancient people. We present pyramids, we present uh, megalithic sites, uh, strange rock art and all sorts of things. But one of the most difficult things with ancient cultures, and particularly historic cultures, 
is that it's very difficult to get into their mindset. And that's why we not only misunderstand them sometimes, very often, but we just can't get it. We, we're not quite sure what they were trying to do. You know, why, why pyramids and why align them and why carry stones, massive stones, <coughs> hundreds of kilometers? Uh, we just don't get it. And for a long, long time, I didn't get it either. Now, I'm not going to pretend I really get it, but um, there is something that I think they uh, did which we didn't do. And that's why I mentioned uh, Francine, who talked about the crop circles. She, at one stage in her talk, she said that we're in a country that looks outside. We're groomed, we're, we're, we're weaned, we're processed from early age to search and to learn outside ourselves. We were given books, we were given uh, things to study, uh, algebra, which I hated, by the way. But, uh, and we bring it inside. Whereas, it's almost certain that the ancients did not do this. They observed, but they somehow tried to understand inside. And uh, uh, recently, I began to use two words about learning. And one is knowledge. Accumulate knowledge, read about it, learn about it. And the other is, which is an ancient Greek word, it's gnosis. It's the difference between the two is, one is the search outside, and the other is the search inside. It's this exploration of the human cosmos, as we're beginning to call it. And hence why it is necessary sometimes to talk about cosmology. So before I go into the desert, I'll take you on an adventure, a pictorial adventure in the desert, into the deep desert. But before I do that, I'd like to sort of do a 10-minute thing about cosmology, which I find very useful uh, when I give talks these days. And I generally uh, <clears throat> ask somebody in the audience, which I'm going to pick up on uh, Mr. Richard Fuzniak here, my webmaster, and I ask them who they are. We as a culture, we as a Western culture, have, and I'm not suggesting you as an audience, but generally as a Western culture, we have stopped for some reason asking the fundamental questions. Who are we? No, really, who are we? What are we doing here? What are we supposed to do here? Where do we come from? And where do we go after death? These are the fundamental questions of existence. And they are the same for us. They have been the same for ancient man and they have been the same since, ancient, since man became conscious. And we still don't have the answers. But what's dangerous about our culture today is that we don't even ask the questions. And we need to. And I'm glad that some of the speakers raised this. Uh, and particularly Francine, because she did say no, we, we, we have to look for these answers, and these answers are mostly inside. And that's the difference between us and the ancients. They, perhaps because they were deprived of the science that we have, perhaps deprived of the technology that we have, and the culture that pushes us to look outside, they instinctively try to answer those questions inside. And for all we know, and this is the, the, the interesting thing about studying ancient cultures, not just because we're finding alignments and we're impressed with the pyramids and all that, is that they may have been able to touch some of the answers. 
And if they have, then it is worth pursuing this. I uh, pointed to my webmaster, Richard, and I said, uh, who is he? And I presume if he stands up, I'm not going to embarrass him for him to stand up, but I presume he would say, I'm Richard Fuzniak, I live in Cambridge. And uh, <clears throat> I'm Robert Boval's webmaster, and I, am a, I used to be an electronic technician. Is that right? And I'm going to say, uh, Richard, uh, no. That's the tag that has been placed on you. I'll tell you who you are. I can't tell you why you're here, I can't tell you where you come from, but I'm going to tell you what you are. From what we understand by cosmology, some 17 billion years ago, some infinitesimally small, beyond belief, small particle of energy, condensed matter, everything that there is in the universe today, you, me, the table, the chairs, your telephones, my computer, everything, was condensed in this matter. And we're told some sort of strange big bang occurs, and it blew up, and it expanded, and within a few million years, formed galaxies, islands of stars floating, billions of them, and each of these billions of galaxies have billions upon billions of stars, and we happen to be one of these, or we happen to be a planet next to a star within a galaxy. Our solar system was formed about four and a half billion years ago. So for something like 12 billion years, 12 billion years, 12,000 thousand million years, the universe has existed without our solar system, without even us. We appear on this planet, as I said, as modern man, only 200,000 years ago. And it is, only, it is only in the last couple of centuries that we began to understand where we, where we are. We're on a globe, in a solar system, two-thirds down the center of a galaxy, near a star, which we call the Sun. We kind of more or less worked it out. So we kind of have our address in the cosmos, more or less. But that's it. We know where we are. But what are we? And there's one phrase that puts it all together. We all come from this, 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 this particle that blew up, everything. But the difference here, as far as we know, is we are sometime, we don't know when, perhaps six billion years ago, perhaps more, there's a star. There's a star that blew up. And particles of this star were captured by another star, our sun and slowly made this wonderful planet we're on. We are, as Carl Sagan said, star stuff. It is not a theory, we are star material. We are star material become conscious. It is as if the universe is trying to find out who it is of what it is, and we're it. As far as we know, we're the only, as far as we know, there may be others out there, but as far as we know, we're the only conscious star stuff that has understood so far where it is. And if we're the only ones, we have one incredible responsibility, to work it out. Otherwise, the whole experiment has been for nothing. And these are the fundamental questions. We have to work out who we are, where we come from, 
what we're here for. We have to ask these things again, as the ancients did. And this is why, for me, it is the adventure of seeking or participating. And we all are in the same quest, all of you. We don't leave it to the people wearing white clothes in, in laboratories or, or academics at universities. We all have that responsibility to participate in that quest. Having said this, why are we interested in people who lived thousands of years ago? I think that for a long time they searched within. They tried to understand their presence in this cosmic environment by looking inside. Now, how do we do this? I'm not so sure. One thing I'm sure, at least from my own experience, is that we need to reconnect. We need to reconnect with the Earth. We need to be part of it rather than being observers. We just can't keep on looking at it as if we come from somewhere else and we can exploit it. We need to be part of it again. We need to somehow do it as a culture. How? I'm not quite sure. But I'll tell you my own little story. And that's where my story, in a sense, begins. Although I had written my books, I had published several books, I found myself once, and I hope I'm not overdo this. Uh, <clears throat> I found myself once in Italy. And for some reason I had gone there because I, I was commissioned to write an article uh, about St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, those who are about my age will be interested because he was branded the first hippie uh, of our Western culture, hence San Francisco, by the way. And uh, I was interested in his story. I, I wanted to find out uh, here was a man who apparently had connected again. He spoke to animals, he wandered around nature, he walked barefoot, and better still, he tried to convince the Roman Catholic Church to return to what he called the apostolic mission, to return back uh, to being human beings. Uh, so I went to Assisi, where uh, he was born and where he lived, and I was rather disappointed. Uh, I don't know if some of you have been there. It's a bit like going to Lourdes. They were selling postcards and statuettes and all this stuff, and I, I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't feel it at all. But as I walked uh, out of the town, as I drove out of the town, I saw a tourist office and it had a poster saying, go and visit the sacred uh, uh, stream of Francis of Assisi in the Abruzzo. The Abruzzo is a region between Rome and the Adriatic. So there I go with my uh, little car, drive to the Abruzzo, and I arrived there late at night, and I go into an hotel, and uh, I booked there. It was one of those little mountain towns, all the women in black outside, and all the youth had gone, apparently, working in Rome, and nothing to do in the evening, so I went to sleep early. Uh, I was, this, this little hotel was, was perched on a hill overlooking a lake. Very pretty, it was beautiful summertime. And I woke up at 4 o'clock, it was still dark, and I opened those wonderful Italian blinds that they have, big windows. And I looked outside, it was dark, but the light of my room shone outside, and out there was a cloud of little summer flies. Minute, minute little things. There was literally millions. It was like a white cloud. And for some reason, I got fascinated because they were kind of moving all at once up and down and sideways, and they were moving outside my window. And the question entered my mind, how did they know all which direction they have to move? There's millions of them. Who is controlling this? Who, where is the, the, the boss fly that is telling them, turn left, turn right? And with this question in mind, I sort of, uh, being the kind of guy who asks the silly questions, I <coughs> put on my clothes, went, out of the hotel, and walk down towards the lake. And for the first time in my life, I call it now an epiphany, but for the first time in my life, I felt something rather odd. 
I kind of stopped because I was becoming aware of noises around me. And uh, Paul Devereux pointed out very well this, this kind of natural noises. I began to hear the toads croaking in the, in the lake and the noise of little fish jumping. And there was a, uh, a little flock of blackbirds flying and they had picked me up and they were, they were making noise. And then I thought I'm going crazy because suddenly I looked around and I thought, I don't know how to put it, but it seemed very real. I thought I heard the plants speak or talk or make a noise. There was no noise, but I thought I could hear something. And I thought, Robert, you're, you're losing it here. I mean, uh, something is not right. And I walked down with this kind of mood. I walked to the, to the lake and I entered the little woods. And I, there was a stream. And I thought, maybe this is the stream of St. Francis. Uh -huh. So anyway, I crossed this little stream, came out of the other side of the woods, and I got the fright of my life. Because about 10 yards from where I'm standing to in front of me was a wild boar, a big one. And they really looked big when you see them in the wild, really big. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he was, he was very upset. He started snorting, and he had these tusks, and he kind of put his front feet, and it looked like he was going to charge. He began to scrape the ground, and I thought, I'm finished. This is it, Robert. You know, I mean, um, forget about these flies and the questions and all this stuff. <laughs> forget about the pyramids. You've got to get away from this boar. You know, th that's it. And how close you are. My life is going to end up being killed by a boar. Who, who would have predicted that? And as I'm there, and I wasn't quite sure what to do. I thought I should run in the, in the stream. Maybe he doesn't like water. Uh, what do I do? And instinctively, I looked at him, or her, I don't know if it was a female. And we both stared at each other. It was kind of eyeballing for, for a few seconds. And all of my being was trying to tell this, this boar who was very upset, I, I, I don't want to hurt you. I'm, 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 don't take it easy. And he just calmed down. He kind of slumped, and he, I swear to God, he blinked at me. And he went. And I thought, I've talked to him. I mean, I, and for just two, three minutes, I'm not quite sure how long it lasted, I felt connected. I don't know how to describe it. I felt like I was plugged in. I felt I was into it again. I, I felt in. I felt like, and I thought, this, this is weird. I mean, I never felt like this. And I must say, I never felt again like this. I, I mean, desperately trying to feel like this again. But at least I felt it once. And I know how it feels to feel connected. <coughs> and I hope you already had the experience or will have it. It's a very strange feeling. You suddenly feel like you belong to it. This is it. I'm, I'm with it. I'm, I'm, I'm part of it. I'm the trees, I'm the boars, I'm the, I'm, I'm the whole thing. I'm with it. And I think this is what ancient man managed to do. And when you do feel connected, you know, it's, it's a very strange feeling. It's like the plants are m my friends. I don't know, they, they, they seem to be with me. The, the animals, the birds, the thing. It's, it's one of the strange epiphanies. And I think this is what it's about. We, we've disconnected ourselves. We've unplugged ourselves. And if all this has any meaning, it's about trying to plug again. It's about trying to... find that, that connection. Okay, so having primed you like this, I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to take you on a trip. And I'm going to tell you exactly where we're going. Uh, we're going to sort of travel down. There we are. Sort of zoom down. And we are geographically in the land of Egypt. And I'll be talking mainly about this region here, which is part of the Greater Sahara. It is the eastern part of the Sahara. And it's very confusing because the Egyptians call it the Western Desert. The people of the Sahara call it the Eastern Sahara. 
And I decided to forget about all this. We're going to call it the Egyptian Sahara. So from now on, it's the Egyptian Sahara. And it's, uh, let me put the borders. I like to see the earth without borders. I hate borders. I'm one of these cosmopolitans. Maybe I should have said that I was born in Egypt myself. I come from a very mixed up family. I've got a Maltese, I had a Maltese mother, a Belgian father, and God knows what ancestors. And uh, I just don't understand borders. I, I just don't get it. Uh, it's very strange that we've drawn these lines and given ourselves titles, and I'm British, you're American, and I'm Turkish, and we're all, we're all part of it. Anyway, let me put the borders just for clarity. And this side is Libya, Sudan, and this is the region that we'll look at. Let me put the labels, there we are. So we label it, we like labeling things. Tag them. And particularly, particularly, I'll be talking about this zone here. And you'll hear a lot about this in the next few years. Gilf Kibir and Jebel Uwainat Uwainat and a very, very little special place called Napta Playa. There you are. I'll take you there now. Uh, just to throw a bit of romance here, uh, some of you may have seen the film The English Patient. Right. Although it was supposed to take place here, they actually filmed in Tunisia. The reason is, as you will see from the pictures I will show you, it is so remote that even the camera crew thought it's far, far too crazy to go and film there. But this is where the famous cave of swimmers is that you saw in the film. You know where she dies in the film? Lady Clayton. She's actually based on a true character, and uh, the English patient was Count Mashi, the Hungarian. Uh, we're not quite sure where he was. He apparently, it turned out to be a, a German spy. But uh, So let me tell you about this. But before I take you how I went there, let me take you through the history, because it's so romantic. I mean, we, 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 I love romance. I, I love going to this place because it's fantastic stories and people who explore them and wonderful characters that will make wonderful Hollywood films. One of them, which I'll be talking, whoops. The whole, I mean, this is incredible. There is a belt of oases. Let me just bring it back here. Siwa. There's a few I haven't marked. There's about five major oases. Siwa, Bahareya, uh, Farafra, Dakhla, and, sorry, Kharga and Dakhla. Uh, Dakhla, I've marked it here because it is the very last oasis today that is linked by roadworks. Beyond there is what we call the open desert, or there's an even more dramatic term, the deep desert. It's like going out at sea. There is no roads, no nothing. And it may look sort of short on a map, but there's about 800 kilometers that separates these areas. And uh, the trip that I will take you on takes five days by four-wheel drive to get there. It shows you how remote it is. Uh, but it's quite amazing for me to think that it is only in 1872, you know, barely over a century, that we actually found some of these oases. There were people living there in these oases, and we didn't know they were there. And then they didn't know the rest of the world. Anyway, the story begins in 1872. They discovered Dakhla. And then an English man, it's always English people you'll see, there's quite a few of them there. Only mad dogs and Englishmen. Eh? <laughs> anyway, one of them in 1917, uh, somehow managed to travel. And although it looks small, he kind of moved about 80 kilometers into the deep desert. Now, it may not sound a lot to you, but uh, in, well, certainly in 1917, they had very primitive means. Uh, they went with these strange little vehicles, some Ford T pre-models. And he discovered something called Abu Balas Hill. It is a hill, and the word Abu Balas means pottery in Egyptian. And they named it so because he found pots, lots of pots. And nobody knew what they were doing there. Now, I must tell you, I should have told you already, that as far as Egyptologists were concerned, in fact, every scholar, until two years ago, they believed that it was impossible 
for ancient people to go beyond Dakhla. The reason being is that to travel into the deep desert, apart from it being very dangerous, is that it's physically impossible to carry the water. There's no water there, it's totally waterless. To carry the water in those vast distances. You just can't have enough burdened animals, and they only had a donkey in those days. There's an optimum number, it's just impossible. It can't be done. And therefore, the conviction was that the pharaohs never went beyond Dakhla. We have evidence of them being there. There are temples and so forth, but beyond there, zero. In fact, no human beings, nothing. But he went to Abu Balas and he found this strange pottery. And here he is. Harding King, he was called. They looked terrific in those days. Anyway, he found these pots. We'll get back to the spots because you see that it's one of those funny things. Small things like this can change the whole perception of what we have about ourselves in the past. Here's the hill, the edge of the hill, and you can see the pots. These are actually pictures taken in 1917. Lots of them. And that was it. And then comes this, this amazing character. Now, when we conjure desert travelers and explorers, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, Rudolf Valentino, Omar Sharif, <laughs> huh? we don't think about this guy. Well, amazingly, he has been dubbed by the Royal Geographical Society of London as the greatest of explorers, certainly the greatest of desert explorers. You hear a lot about him again because of the books that we're bringing out. His name is Hassanin, Ahmed Hassanin Bey. Amazing guy, born from a very rich family. He was sent to Oxford, Balliol College, to study politics. He was a, among many things, he was a fencing Olympic champion. And you will see later on that very romantic guy, he even seduced the Queen of Egypt. They say that they were married in secret. Quite a character. Very romantic, very enthusiastic. He became the uh, tutor of King Farouk, the last king of Egypt. He became chief of the protocol, chief of the Diwan. Uh, spoke beautiful English, apparently. He gave lectures and having been educated at Oxford. And a uh, big womanizer, loved women. Uh, he seduced a, a very interesting lady. You will see her in a minute now. There she is. Rosita Forbes. Uh, she was quite a character. Uh, she happened to be in Cairo in the 1920s. And uh, before she was introduced to Hassanen, they say, I don't want to be sort of uh, a rumor monger here, but uh, <laughs> she, they say that she had a little fling with Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, they used to see her a lot sort of escaping together somewhere in the alleyways of Cairo. But anyway, she was introduced to uh, Ahmed Hassanen. And Ahmed Hassanen at the time um, had it in his mind, apart from his passion for women and fencing and all this stuff, he had this thing about the desert. It's, it's one of those things. It grabs certain people. I'm one of those. It just gets you. It's one, it becomes an obsession. You just want to go back. The Arabs say that you meet God when you go in the desert. And I think they're probably right. There's something that happens. You're, you're kind of... You're just near whatever it is. You know, crop circle builders, I don't know. You're near whatever it is, and you sense it. Anyway, he got the bug, and he wanted to go and find, there was rumors, there still are, about lost oases, so Shangri-Las of the desert. He wanted to go and explore and, and, and discover. He was, had this bug. And he got permission. In those days, it was pretty... But he, amazingly, he decided to take Rosita Forbes with him. Now, this is 1920. And I wouldn't even advise women today to go on their own. Um, this is pretty dangerous territory, and, and still the Bedouins are rather kind of shy uh, about foreigners, and certainly about women traveling on their own. But anyway, he decided to take Rosita Forbes. They got permission from the king of Egypt, with special papers, and they went in to go, they wanted to be the first foreigners to reach the oasis of Kufra. Now, Kufra, nobody had been there. It's an oasis on the Libyan border, I'll show it to you now. And uh, he wanted to be the first to go there. And so they did. And here's the trip they did. They started off in the edge 
where Egypt meets uh, Libya at the border here, and they traveled to the Kufra oasis, and they did this journey in 1921. Uh, they returned back, and they reached the oasis of Syria and back to Cairo. It took them about two months to do it. Hailed as heroes, uh, for Rosita Ford wrote a book uh, called the, the, the Lost Oasis of Kufra, and he wrote a book, uh, and he came to give a talk to the Royal Society, except that suddenly this apparent fling that they might have had in the desert turned sour. And uh, I wish I had known Rosita Forbes. She's, <laughs> she must have been quite a character. She, she travels around the world. She, she went to explore China and did also those wonderful British ladies who traveled in those days. And anyway, it turned a bit sour because she published a book first and she kind of introduced Hassanen as a kind of, uh, as a kind of glorified guide, really. And he was very much a gentleman, and he didn't sort of contest this. And apparently he gave a talk at the Royal Society, uh, and the uh, Geographical Society, and he uh, kind of ignored the, the, the kind of commentaries that were being made in the press, that he was, he was Rosita Forbes' little boy and all that. But he decided that he was going to do something else. He was going to do the most daring of explorations ever attempted. He was going to start all over again, Excuse me. From here, and he was going to go in search of the real lost oasis, unnamed. There was rumors at Kufra that there was some sort of lost oasis with wonderful things there. Nobody had been there, and he wanted to go there. And so again, a year and a half later, he went, set up his base at uh, Solum. That's, uh, there he is, wonderful, sexy, huh? <laughs> anyway, there he is. And he, um, <clears throat> he died very young, actually, very sadly. He was in a car crash, like Lawrence of Arabia, by the way. And uh, he attempts this trip with camels. Uh, I mean, I tell you, I've done it with four-wheel drives, and I, I wouldn't even dream of doing half the trip in camels. But anyway, he managed to do it, and he reached this zone. Now, he passed from Hufra, and he finally reached this zone, which he himself called Uwainat. He named, and you will see it because I went there uh, recently. Uh, so I'll, I'll spare you the pictures till I get there. Now, <clears throat> what he found was something extraordinary. Nobody knew that there was mountains in this region. It's, in fact, the tallest peak in the Sahara. Uh, it's a small mountain region. It's about 30 kilometers in diameter. And it is this region that is going to change everything we know about ancient Egypt. You're going to see why. In fact, probably everything we know about civilization. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry, I... I... <laughs> it's the Pharaoh's curse. That, uh... Hello, can I have you back? Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yes. Uh, so he discovered this region, which he called the Wainat. In Arabic, Wainat means little eyes. And the, the Arabs used the word eyes to define wells, or, or, or more, more precisely, ponds, natural ponds. <laughs> Uh, because they believed that it was kind of like the eye of the earth. And these ponds, of course, in the desert are extremely valuable. He found the only source of water in this whole region. If you're going to travel there, <laughs> you want to make sure that you get there, because if you don't make it there, you're going to have water to return. But anyway, <clears throat> he discovered Uwainat. And uh, there it is. It's from Google Earth. It's the region, and that's his path. Now, quite extraordinarily, because he passed in the, on the Libyan border, he missed an even bigger region, which is the size of Switzerland. If you can imagine Switzerland without trees, it is amazing. It's, there's mountains, and, but no vegetation, nothing, zero. Anyway, when he was at Uwainat, 
he actually reached this point. And there, here is a wonderful romantic story. It was considered uninhabited. There was no possibility of human beings living there. And even the Bedouins who traveled in the deserts were quite amazed that this place was not known and they didn't expect to find anybody there. And as Hassanen is sleeping on his first night at Uwainat, there is a young girl, apparently, maybe that was her, I don't know, it's a picture taken by Hassanen himself, who wakes him up with a bowl of milk. It's totally startled. They didn't expect to find human beings there. And she spoke a strange language. It turned out to be, eventually, they found out that it was a language called Tebu, from the Tebu people, the ancient Bedouins. And she somehow, there was a, one of the Bedouins who kind of understood a bit of Tebu, one of the guides, and she said, uh, I want to take you to my king. King. And indeed, they took him. There they are, these people. Now, I'm showing it to you because they've disappeared. Uh, amazingly, people went there a few years later and they were no more there. And we have no idea where they've gone, who they were, and where they had come from. But he managed to take these pictures. Uh, I think I know where they come from and we'll end up our talk with that. But uh, They are probably the last uh, inhabitants of this area which spawned the pharaonic civilization, as you're going to see. Uh, there's the king, it's called King Henny. And there was about 150 of them. Anyway, he took pictures of them, and King Henny said, uh, he asked, well, where do you come from? And he said, we always lived here, but there were people living before us. And he said, how do you know? He says, well, we have their pictures drawn on the rocks. And Hassanin said, show me. And he went to show them pictures. And this is actually taken in 1920. And what he was amazed was that he saw in the supposedly totally arid area, and I have modern pictures, so we look at them more carefully, creatures that were not supposed to be there. Giraffes, elephants, lions, rhinoceros. When? And took a few pictures and he reported this to the Royal Astronomy. This was the first time that we found out, and that's 1923, not only of this area, but that we knew that there were people living in those zones. Before that, like I said, all Egyptologists were convinced that not only nobody lived there, but the pharaohs didn't go there. Anyway, upon his returns, I'm showing you this picture because he seduced the queen of, of uh, Egypt. Nice looking lady. She died in the United States, by the way, in case you're interested. And she's converted to Christianity for some reason, I don't know why. She was actually half French, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, and that's another man. <laughs> uh, he is Prince Kamal Nureddin. He was next to the throne after King Fuad. He rejected the throne because he wanted to be a desert explorer like Hassanin. But he had money. And so, there's this wonderful picture. I mean, it's quite amazing. <laughs> he had the Citroën company build him this very first four-wheel drive. It's the very first ever four-wheel drive ever built. They look terrific, huh? And he said, I'm going to go to Uwainat. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to see what Hassanin says, and I'm going to take cameras, and I'm going to photograph, and I'm going to find these ancient people on this. And so he did. He, he, they shot off in the desert. And that's his trip, except that instead of going on the Libyan side, he went to Dakhla, and from there on cut into the deep desert. And that is why he found this area, whereas Hassanin had bypassed it. He found this, Switzerland, Shangri-La, in the Sahara. He called it Gilf Kibir. Gilf Kibir is 300 kilometers long. It's 80 kilometers thick. It's literally the size of Switzerland. Even today, hardly explored. 
Uh, I'm saying this because I'm, I'm, I now take people there, in case you want to join one of my trips, we'll, we'll announce something at the end. And there it is, 1926. Amazing, we didn't know it was there. He pushed to Wainat and then he returned to Cairo. He was hailed again as a hero, all this stuff. And who was a friend of his? Oh, there he is in his older age. Oh, there's another guy. And that's, uh, this is, a, I tell you, it's amazingly romantic. I hope I'm not boring you with this, but uh, Major Ralph Bagnold. Uh, who knows about <laughs> Ralph Bagnold? Actually, he had a very famous sister. Huh? Uh, she was an author. I always forget her name. She wrote uh, National Velvet. That's right. Well done. And uh, sh her husband was apparently the, uh, the uh, originator of the Reuter uh, journalism. Anyway, there is Ralph Bagnell who decides he too is going to explore. And he goes, he tries to go to Gilfri Kibir. He doesn't quite make it. And there he is with his uh, Ford T vehicle. We're talking about the 1930s now. And they got stuck in the sand. Uh, I'm showing you this because these are very rare pictures. They were, they were found recently. Uh, I don't know how they took these cars there, I tell you. Even with modern forward drives, it's quite a, quite a journey. And uh, he found the first evidence of these famous circles that I'll be showing you. It's actually known as the Bagnall Circle. It was found in 1930. Nobody to this day has studied the circle. We've started studying it. I'm saying we because I'm writing a book with, I've just finished a book with an astrophysicist called Tom Brophy. And the book will be published at the end of this year. Uh, it is no doubt an astronomical circle. By the way, it's 8,000 years old. It's still there. It's, 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 it's really spooky when you go there. And then comes the most romantic figure of all, who happened to be a friend of Prince Kamal, Count El Mashi, the English patient. And he decides, there he is, he's not so handsome as, uh, <laughs> as Ralph Fien, is he? <laughs> uh, shows you what Hollywood can do, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually quite a romantic story. But he decides to do something else. Rather than go by car, he actually decides to do it by plane. And he convinces two rich aristocrats, uh, Lord and Lady Clayton, who are the characters in the film. And they decide to go there by, by a little gypsy moth. There it is. And they discover, they go to Gilf Kibir and they discover the famous cave of swimmers. Uh, I've actually slept in the cave of swimmers. I had a wonderful night there. Uh, and there they found more of this rock art. It's all over the place. We're finding rock art by the day then, these days. Now, now suddenly everybody's interested. But what was interesting about this particular rock art, I'll show you pictures later on, uh, was that people were swimming. I actually found people swimming, drawing. And now we come to modern times. And who's this guy? Another one, another crazy desert explorer, uh, a German. Surprisingly, because of the Model T Ford, he was a representative of the Ford Company in Munich. And he went to Egypt, they sent him as a commercial manager, and he resigned. He bought 12 camels, <laughs> and he decided to become a desert explorer. <laughs> this was in 1980. I know Carlo, he's a good friend of mine. And Carlo just wandered the desert. He based himself in Dakhla Oasis, and he wandered the desert. And he offered his services here and there, and took tours around, and he worked for the... German Archaeological uh, Exploration Society, and so forth. And he's the man. I mean, it shows you, it's always outsiders. He discovered what is known today as the Abu Balas Trail. You remember this, this, this hill that the English guy found with the, with, the, with, the, with the pottery? He not only discovered, but he worked out what the pottery was all about. There were donkey water stations, fuel stations. The pharaohs, we're going to find out now, the pharaohs actually went where we didn't go till 1926. We thought we had discovered, why not? We thought we had discovered Gilfi Kibir. Well, we didn't. The pharaohs did it 5,000 years ago. 
And we have the proof now. And again, two crazy explorers, you'll meet them soon. Anyway, Carlo Bergman decides to explore this Abu Balas hill, and he discovered, here's Abu Balas, this Abu Balas hill, and he discovered all along here a trail of small Abu Balas hills, pottery. And it's well accepted now. What the pharaohs did, they, we know they're pharaohs because there is markings of the pharaohs on these pots. You're going to see some modern pictures of these pots now. They literally lay these pots, and they would go and fill them with water, come back, go to the next station, fill and go back, and they prepared the caravan routes. So when the caravan was ready, they would find these stations, and they would refill the donkeys. In case you're interested, you need two liters. Uh, the donkey travels at about uh, 15 kilometers with two liters of water. Okay? So you have to fill it up every 15 kilometers. <laughs> with water, at least it's water. <laughs> and that's one of his books, he wrote the last of the Bedouins, the lights Bedouin. He regards himself, there's, there's the modern pots by the way. That's how they look like. They're still there, trail of them. Well, what he demonstrated was that the pharaohs at least attempted to go to Gilf Kibir. Now, why would they want to go there? In fact, how did they know it was there in the first place? And I know it sounds like, believe me, it's one hell of a track. You really have to be sure that there's going to be something there, at least water. Well, they had their pots, but you had to know there was something there. Otherwise, there's no point of taking your risk and, and going into the open desert and, and die. But the conclusion was that the pharaohs attempted to reach these areas, never quite made it, and kind of backtracked. No evidence at all of pharaonic presence beyond there. And that was the end of the story until, there's some more pictures. They're all over the place, by the way, it's quite, quite amazing. They're about, <clears throat> these are particularly dates to about the Fourth of, sorry, the Sixth Dynasty, which places it about 2200 BC. In them, they still found food, uh, bits of grains and stuff. They actually had stations with food and water. There's from the hill looking down. And there's Carlo at hospital, you know, he overdid it. Um, he went trekking in the middle of winter, and I was telling people, you don't want to do that, you catch these terrible flus and colds, cold to the chest. And there's another guy here, there's Mahmoud Marai, another one of these crazy explorers. And here it is. I'm looking more carefully, look at the area here. And Mahmoud Marai was contacted by a fellow called Mark Borda. Now, I, it's, it's very strange, I'm, I'm running out of time here. Can I keep going? Yeah. I'm, yeah, 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Mark Borda is a Maltese businessman. He met me in 1998 on one of my tours. And I never heard of Mark Borda since. And in December 2007, I got a call from Mark Borda. I had completely forgotten about him saying, Robert, I've been exploring the Sahara. <laughs> what have you been doing, Mark? And I said, oh, no. he's one of these confirmed bachelor guys, you know, Phineas Fogg type guy. Yeah. And uh, he just uses his money to explore the Sahara. And he did the same thing as he became friends with Carlo Bergman, and he bought some more camels, and they, off they went. <laughs> and he con contracted this guy, Mahmoud Marai, who is also another explorer, and they decided to go to Jebel Uwainat. And Basically, what they wanted to do was find some more of this rock art that had been reported and we'll take pictures. And off they went. Here they are. Romantic guys. This, this looks more serious now. And you can well, look very carefully between them. They, I'll, I'll show you where they actually went. Uh, they were quite courageous. They actually crossed the Sudanese border. There, there is no real border there. I mean, it's just a line on the picture here. It's just desert. And they crossed here. 
and they went on the south side of, of Jebel Wainat, and somewhere here, and the picture is taken there. Sorry, here it is. This picture, this moment, will change everything we know about ancient Egypt, because they found, for the first time, look very carefully, hieroglyphic writing. The pharaohs went there. It's actually a cartouche of King Mentuhotep II. And here it is. I have to go back to another story. In God, 10 minutes, I'm not going to do it. Uh, because the pharaohs told us that they went there and the Egyptologists wouldn't believe them. Except they had different names. In the 5th and 6th dynasty, there is a man called Harkuf. Harkuf lived in Aswan. He was the governor of Aswan in Upper Egypt. And for some reason, the pharaoh, Pepi II, who was a boy pharaoh, actually, like Tutankhamun, gave him orders to go and explore the kingdom of Yam. And so he did. He did four expeditions. He even tells us that he took the oasis road. And yet the Egyptologists were utterly convinced that the kingdom of Yam was somewhere between the first and second cataract on the Nile in the Sudan. And they have it marked on the Egyptological maps and all that. Well, this inscription not only tells us that the pharaohs went there, but that the pharaoh is meeting an envoy from Yam. How did they, do, how did they know this? It completely changes our picture about these people. Not only the geography of Egypt suddenly blows itself, but they went to meet this people of Yam. Who are these people? And uh, let's see if I have a picture of the inscription. I don't know if you can see it from there. Let me get closer. That's Mark Border, by the way. Uh, OK, anyway, on the way back, I think I have a picture later on. On the way back, they, they now what these guys do, which Egyptologists do not do, they actually go on foot. They actually go on foot or ride camels. You have to do that, otherwise you're not going to make discoveries. This inscription has been there for four and a half thousand years. Nobody had seen it. They only found it because they went on foot. This is the new way of exploring in the desert. We, we're introducing this foot exploration because it's no use going with four-wheel drives. You're going to miss everything. And as they went on foot, and I'm talking about like 60 days later, they look a bit haggard there, uh, they decided they explored the edge of Jebel Wenat on the north side, and they stumbled in a cave. There it is. And it's the most extraordinary cave. I've been there uh, recently. I'm, I'm the second person visiting this cave. The drawings are something else. The artistic quality of these prehistoric people. And we can't date them. We can't date them. There's apparently a very strange technique. It's beehives. Because there was so little humidity in the area. When they did those drawings, when the, the, the paint was wet, apparently bees would go and sort of attach and build a hive. And some of the hives are still there. And you can carbon date the hives. Interesting. There it is. Let me get closer. We now know how they look like. The people of Yam. Who were they? Look very carefully. They actually wear hats or plumes. There's a lady here sitting and doing something. She wears this fantastic whatever it is. They have uh, jewelry. And you can't see it too clearly here, but they dress like the ancient Egyptians. See the... Uh, pyramid-shaped kilt. Uh, I, there is too much to, to look into. Uh, there's hundreds of pictures, but I'm not going to show you all this. I only have five minutes left. Look at the, the quality of the drawing there. And it's quite amazing when you, you enter a cave that has been untouched for 8,000 years. This is 8,000 years. It looked like it was done yesterday. When we sent the pictures to magazine, they thought it was a fake. Anyway, so Mark Border phones me up and says, uh, go and meet Mahmoud Marai. And uh, we found these inscriptions. And I knew immediately what it meant. Uh, the pharaohs went there. But then I knew the story of Harkuf. Harkuf says not only that he went there, he went to meet the ancestors. He went to meet what they call the Ahu people. 
<laughs> the Egyptian word for Ahu means spiritual people, but they refer to them as ancestors. They knew their ancestors. So I had to go there. I just had to do it. And I asked Marai to organize an expedition for me. And I'll take you through the pictures very quickly, because um, some of you may be interested to join me on my next one. Um, it's tough stuff. <laughs> so it's not for the, the, those who don't like sleeping outdoors, and particularly those who like to stay clean. <laughs> you, 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 have, you can't wash for 12 days. I'm looking at the ladies in particular. Um, you can just about rinse your face, but because we have to take the water, and it's, it's huge amounts of water at the piano. There we are. We did the strip, so we reorganized the strip to reach Wainat, and we drove uh, to Dakhla. It takes uh, an overnight trip to reach Dakhla. You sleep at Bahareya. We prepared our gear there, and off we went to look for this kingdom of Yam. <coughs> There's the expedition. This is Tom Brophy, by the way, my co-author. And we took two ladies, by the way. One of them is my wife, Michelle. Michelle is very French, and she took a long time to persuade her to come. Um, they thought it was going to be... A, actually, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I'll tell you one thing. It's very strange how very quickly you get into... Uh, I don't like to use the word primitive, but you get back into nature. It's very, very quick. You know, within two days, suddenly everybody knew what they were doing. And I'd see them wandering in the morning with a little toilet paper and go behind the dune and come back. And it's, it's very strange what they did. And, and suddenly everybody knows what they're supposed to do automatically. And we go and pick wood if we find, <coughs> prepare the fire. And there's Mahmoud. We're, we're now, well, I'm skipping a lot because we're moving into deep deserts on our way to Gilf Kibir, Tom Brophy here. Uh, we're stopping at the various. Now, by the way, here is the very interesting thing. I, I, I omitted saying this. but. Carlo Bergman, you know, the, the, the German guy with his camels, found something else. He found something that is known today as the Jedefra Water Mountain, another one of these stations. But Jedefra, you'll see his cartouche there, I hope. Oops, we don't, but it's on the wall there. Jedefra was the son of King Cheops. And there is cartouches of King Cheops on this desert region. The pyramid builders went there. And we had no idea of this. Uh, that's me. And there we're at Bagnall Circle. Remember that Bagnall Circle? Uh, Tom Brophy and I are now actually measuring it and taken. And we reach Gilf. we pretty exhausted by that time. Yeah? That's six days without washing, in case you're interested. We, we, we sort of kept away from each other, you know. Uh, uh, we're now camping in the Gilf. There's the um, cave of swimmers that you saw with uh, Almashi, Count Almashi. There's the swimmers. Do you see them here? They're diving and having a good time. And I, it's very difficult to describe, uh, but I'll try it. It's like visiting another planet. You get this very strange feeling after five days of trekking in the totally uninhabited regions. No signs of civilization, nothing. And you reach this place, and it's like being in a different planet. But what is interesting is that you're kind of meeting, at least in this form, people who are there. And there's a sense, again, it's hard to describe, there's a sense of timelessness. It doesn't matter what century you're in. You're, you're, you feel like part of that process. You're, you're one of them. I, I, it's, you have to go there to sense this. It's, again, one of these strange connections. Uh, there's these uh, rock arts. There's the only thing that indicates you're entering the Sudan. We had to enter illegally, by the way. Uh, but so what? <laughs> We're now at Wainat. Very eerie. Very eerie. I can tell you, it's kind of very strange. Uh, you, you feel like... Every corner you take, you might bump into some strange person. You know, I don't know. It's, it's one of those feelings. It's like I don't know. It's like feeling that you've landed on Mars. It's one of those things. By the way, I was telling uh, one of the geologists here, uh, uh, who uh, were talking about this. They're actually NASA studied this region because it actually resembles Mars. Anyway, 
see those two peaks there? We, we give them names because these places have names. We, we started calling them the two peaks and uh, borders rock and stuff like that. And there is Mahmoud showing me the, the inscriptions. And there it is with uh, Brofi and I. Now, what? Okay, the pharaohs went there, there were people there, there were ancestors. But did they really kick off the pharaonic civilization? I mean, how can these seemingly primitive people cause the pharaonic civilization? And I'm going to go very quickly because I'm not going to be scolded here for my time, but here we are, the, the region. <coughs> pharaohs went there, but here is another region. And you will certainly hear a lot about this, Napta Playa. Napta Playa was discovered in 1974. For some reason, it took to 1998 to realize that it was an astronomical site. They call it the Stonehenge of the desert. Uh, there are megaliths there, but they're not as big as Stonehenge. But it's one of those things. It's not so much their size. It's what they mean. Because what they found, uh, as they started finding this in 1998, is that they have astronomical alignments. Uh, there is one of the stone circles. Very strange stuff, very strange stuff. No signs of human beings, except what they left us. A bit like Stonehenge, just the rocks. But here they are doing strange stuff. We found tumuli. We thought they were going to be tombs. Excavated them, they buried two-ton rocks. Why they would do that? And they would bury the rock three meters down, cover it with the tumuli, and when we went under, when we removed the rocks and went under, we found a natural outcrop that was hand-carved. Now the sediment, the sediment to cover up to that level, we know that the bottom was exposed maybe 12,000 years ago. These people were there 12,000 years ago, and their presence there was still three, till about 3,500 BC. They stayed for thousands of years. And what they did, which we never would have suspected, they not only observed the stars, the main reason is that they moved big distances and they had to learn how to navigate, but they tracked them over time. It's the first evidence that we finally have that ancient people, thousands of years before the pharaohs, tracked what we call the precession of the equinox. Hard proof. Uh, I don't have time to go into all that, but here's one of these strange rocks that... By the way, this is um, a fellow called Fred Wendorf, one of the discoverers from the Boulder Cor uh, from the University of Texas, the Methodist University of Texas. It actually looks like strange, like a cow if you look at it. It's fashioned by human hands. There's no doubt about it. It had an, a, a natural split. Unfortunately, it's split into two. There's the large megaliths all over the place. These guys dragged tons, and we really have no idea why they were doing it. It's riddled with these stones all over the place. Comes in the astronomer Kim Melvin, and he's the one who discovered all the alignments. Uh, the, the stone circle that you've seen has solstitial alignments to the uh, summer solstice. There's a line of sight, and one to the uh, meridian. There's no doubt. It's an astronomical circle. Uh, 29 stones, of course, the lunar month. By the way, the, the Bagnell circle, we now know that they're both tied, and they're 700 kilometers apart. The Bagnell Circle has 29 stones and has astronomical alignments. Come in Tom Brophy. Uh, what Kim Melville discovered, not at the circle, they found that there were lines of stones, about half a kilometer long, some of them pointing eastwards and some of them pointing northwards. Now, there is three constellations, and only three constellations, and we know for sure that the ancient Egyptians, the pyramid builders, used and observed for their rituals, for their sightings, for all the things that they did for their religion. In the north, the Big Dipper. In the east, Orion and Sirius. And what they found there is exactly those three constellations being tracked over thousands of years. They were not only observing the same constellations, they were tracking them. Uh, it's, I don't want to go into too much of the mathematics here, but you'll be hopefully reading my book. Here is one of the alignments, one of the megaliths, and you can't see the distant ones. It, they shoot towards the east, and so we're observing. I, mean, I have to go fast here. Um, sundials, 8,000 years ago. Strange mushroom-shaped megaliths. 
We know that they were put there by human hands because the rock is not natural. It was carted from about three, four hundred meters away. <coughs> there you are. I'm going to have to close, but what we now think, this is it, this is the bottom line, is that I remember I spoke about 200,000 years ago somewhere in the east. This woman gave birth, spread around the world, you are it. But one group, one group, black Africans, about, we think about 25,000 years ago, moved to the Chad, the Tibesti. The reason we think that is because not only, the, you can see the route here now, why not? They probably came down. We know this because we found the same rock art at Tibesti Mountains. Very mysterious region. This is the next expedition. I'm going to try and do it. It's very dangerous. There's a civil war going on there. But here is what we think now. That about 12, 15,000 years ago, they came here. They stayed here for a long time. Eventually came down here. And by that time, they had acquired all the rudiments of civilization. They knew astronomy. They had domesticated cattle, as you've seen. Agriculture and moving stones. They entered the Nile Valley probably at around 3,500, maybe 3,800, injected this knowledge in a hunter-gathering society that was there, and lo and behold, we have the Egyptian civilization. I'll stop here because I'm well over my time. Thank you very much. It was fantastic.